John chapter 11. We just come off of John chapter 10 where Jesus is kind of uh, telling that he is the good shepherd and comparison and comparing himself to the other Pharisees and religious leaders who are saying, you are not good shepherds, you're kind of goats actually, you're not even sheep. And so there was uh, a little rebuke, sharp rebuke. So again, Jesus making these guys a, a, a little angry. Um, and then we're kind of getting up now to the last weeks, right? Before we we're in the last six months of Jesus' life, this is in the last weeks, okay? The last couple weeks, most Bible scholars believe, even up to a week. So this is the last couple weeks of Jesus' life. Um, and so right after this, after this public display of kind of rebuking, declaring himself to be God, all of these things, we pick it up in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. So follow with me. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister uh, Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with the fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So now we know this man, Lazarus, and Mary and Martha were people uh, that Jesus was very fond with, that he was really close friends with, um, that he loved even. And even here as we read through this, there was a special kind of love, not that Jesus doesn't love us all the same, but they were his friends, just like you would have close friends. This was uh, these for Jesus. And so they come and they say, hey, Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. And this begins uh, perhaps the most remarkable miracle that Jesus um, ever performed uh, besides raising himself from the dead, that he actually raises someone else from the dead who'd been in the tomb for four days. All right, so other, okay, you're, people are receiving their sight, the lame people are walking, right? Lame as in not like not cool, but can't walk, hurt, broken, paralyzed, okay? The lame people are, are seen walking and seen healed, and but now all of a sudden he's going to do something totally unprecedented, right? Something that would get the Jews in such an uproar that it's like, we have to, at the end of this chapter, you'll see, we have to kill him. We have to get rid of him. And this was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, here's this man declaring himself to be God. Now he has just, or at least people are saying he rose Lazarus from the dead. We, we have to take him out. We have to get rid of him. So this begins um, these last weeks of Jesus' life because of this miracle. Lazarus' name is actually comes from, uh, is, is the Greek form of Eleazar, which actually means God is my help, which I think is very interesting considering he, you know, died and was for four days, you know, and then came back and that God literally was his help. And so they, they loved Jesus and, and Jesus loved him and he was sick. And so you would think Jesus would, would go right away, um, but he doesn't here in, in these next verses. Um, but I want us to also understand that um, Jesus does not separate uh, uh, our, our, our needs, right, for his love. And so sometimes we're getting ready to see here, as he doesn't come right away, that just because he doesn't answer right away or he doesn't meet a need or even a want right away, that doesn't mean that he doesn't love us, right? And I think that's very important as we get in here, get in this. And we also see that we, we still need God. In the sense of that, just because we are saved and just because we know Jesus, we are still men and women, we're still flesh, we're still human. Doesn't mean we never get sick. Doesn't mean that we don't physically die. Doesn't mean the bad things don't happen to us, right? We're still always in need of God. And so there's sometimes this idea of that because, oh, well, Lazarus was a special friend of Jesus. And Mary and Martha were special friends. He should have come in and healed him right away and, you know, saved him and not cause all this grief. Right? And then so now we can compare, well, because, you know, I'm going through all these hard things, people think, well, man, that person must have done something really bad. Or we think ourselves, man, God doesn't love me because he's allowing all this pain and suffering and things to come my way. And sometimes the case is just it's our own fault because we made stupid choices, right? And sometimes it's just the case that God is allowing something or causing something in our life, all right, that we have to trust him and it doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. It doesn't mean um, that we don't need him even though uh, we have him in our hearts and in our lives. Even, we are still human beings. So look at verses 4 and 6, 4 through 6. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he had heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Lazarus was already dead when Jesus had said this. 
Because it took a day's journey for them to, to come and then tell Jesus, right? And then it was, you know, two days and then another day till Jesus rose him. So it's very likely that he was probably already dead. So here Jesus is saying, you know, this sickness is not into death. So Jesus had this, obviously could see the, the, the foreknowledge, had the foresight to see everything. And, okay, he's actually dead, but it's not leading to death. And so this is the God we serve. This is the Jesus that we're talking about. And the point was what? To, to bring glory to God. The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, the Son of God may be glorified through it. And that's what he told the blind man, if you remember, a couple chapters back. When the disciples were like, hey, who sinned, this man or his, uh, or their, his parents, that he was born blind? He said, neither. This man was born blind that God would what? Be glorified. And so it's the same thing here when Jesus is doing these miracles, uh, but it's not without pain and suffering in other individuals' lives, Right? And so sometimes we want all the glory. We want to see God glorified. We want to be a man or a woman of God that follows God, but we don't want any trials, pain, suffering, or to go through anything. We just kind of want to be saved, and then now all of a sudden I'm, I'm glorified and I'm perfect and I, I do all the right things and make all the right choices. Well, it doesn't happen that way. It's like the same thing if, if you want to be you know, super strong and buff, you actually have to get in the weight room and work out. You can't just go in there and look at it. You can't just buy a membership. You can't just drink a, a, a whole bunch of protein shakes and then sit on the couch and watch Harry Potter, right? Like, it's, it's, eh, it doesn't do anything. But we, in our minds, like that easy way. Just what's the easiest thing to do that I can... Um, be powerful, I can have strength, I can be whatever it is that I want to be without the least amount of work. And you guys know as well as I do that uh, it takes effort. It takes work for most, if not any, good thing. And so now Jesus loved Mary and Martha and his sister and Lazarus. And it was an important reminder, I think, because this is going to test their faith, right? This is going to test their faith. So for us as the readers... This is going to test their faith as we look and we see, like, hey, he's going to wait two more days. He's going to wait two more days for these things to happen. And this is not a a denial of God's love for them. Like, man, Mary and Martha, I'm just so mad at you because of that one time you did this. And so this is what's going to happen, right? And so it's not that at all. It's for a reason. It's for a purpose. And so even though I may not be able to answer every question to you of why you suffer, and why pain comes in this world. I can give some theological reasons and some scriptures. But one thing I know for sure, for fact, that the word of God tells us that our pain and our suffering is not in vain. It's for a reason, it's for a purpose. And you may not ever see it, and we may not know it, but it's for a reason, a purpose. The things that America goes through, or China, or Europe, or you know, parts of Africa, wherever it will be, the things that, that, that are happening, God sees and knows all, and it's for reasons and a purpose and a plan that he has to save as many humans as would desire to come unto him, right? And so we must understand that that we may not ever see that, but it's always for a reason and purpose. So remember that. When you're going through something, there's always hope because it is never in vain. God just doesn't sit around and like, oh, I'm just gonna mess with Mary and Martha. (laughs) You guys watch this. We're gonna wait two days so they're like crying, like real bad, and then I'll show up and I'll raise them from the dead. (laughs) Won't that be a funny joke, guys? No, right? Like the disciples would be like, dude, you're evil. You know, I'm out of here. That's not Jesus' heart. It's for a reason and purpose. So he doesn't do it with them. He's He's not gonna do it with us. That's my point. Stayed two more days. Two more days of their agonized grief, right? Jesus refused to grant their request, and then he fulfilled it after showing that he does things according to his timing and his will, right? It's God's timing. Someone once said it's, it's his will, it's his work, and it's his way, right? The three W's. And we sometimes have a problem with that. Like, God, I want to know your will, all right? The work I really don't like to work. And the way you're doing it, God, I definitely had a better way, (laughs) right? And so those things are hard, hard for us as uh, as humans and and dealing with a fallen world and dealing with each other, right? Even us in this right now, I, I believe most of us are probably believers in this room. And even dealing sometimes with each other can be difficult. Nonetheless, someone who doesn't even believe Nonetheless, someone who is totally against Christ or um, you know, doesn't really know if he exists or doesn't or whatever it would be it is very, very difficult. And so, even though he refused to come right away, it was for a reason and a purpose, and it was according to his will, not man. So remember that when you're going through a trial. Remember that when something's happening, that God is near, but he's allowing you to go through it for a reason and a purpose. 
verses uh, 7 through 10. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the, uh, of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not uh, in him. I think this is where my daughter gets her logic for the days. Like I would try to explain to her uh, that there's 24 hours in a day. And she says, no, because it's nighttime. And, uh, and she's like, so there's only 12 hours in a day. I was like, well, I understand what you're saying, but day can mean like light, you know, that there's actual day light outside, and then there's a day where it's like encompasses a, a whole time period of, of a day, like December 1st or so forth, and she's just like, no, there's 12 hours in a day because it's dark out. And it's like, well, I guess just kind of Jesus said it right here too, right? Um, so maybe that's where she get it. She's been reading her Bible. How to ask her. Um, but the whole point here is uh, a couple things. One, that we need to know. The disciples say, hey, let's not go back to Judea again. Why? Because they just left there from John chapter 10 and they tried to stone him again. So he said, you want to go back into the city where they just tried to kill you? Jesus, are you sure that this is a good idea? And his point is, is basically like what he's trying to say is that there's 12 hours out a day. That there's nothing can shorten his time, right? He has a purpose, and he, he needs to get what he needs to get done, and he's not going to die until his appointed time, right? It's like I know when my end is. It's not right now. And if we walk in the day and we, we go back and get our work done um, in the daytime why we're here, why we can do it, the, the time is now, that kind of thing. And so he's just like, Let, let's go. That doesn't matter. We have work that needs to be done, and let's go and do it. Uh, verses 11 through 15. Then these things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, you idiots. No, that was the Brandon version. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So all through scripture we see that Jesus refers to, and even Christians later on refer to death, a Christian death, as sleep. Because you guys know, and if you don't, you will now, that you know, when we die, right, we don't, we, our bodies will physically die, but then we start a new life of eternity with Christ in heaven forever and ever, right? So the reality is, is, you know, our bodies go to sleep, and they will be raised in the last day, and we can talk about the end times and how all of, how all of that works, but the reality is, is to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ, right? Um, heaven most likely probably exists outside of time. God created time, so it's not an issue. Well, well, when does this happen? Do I just sleep? So the people that died a thousand years ago, are they just like a thousand years of like a soul sleep? or where? And we could talk about all this theology, but the reality is I don't think it's a problem for God, okay? He's, he's built, he's made everything. He's raising people from the dead. He's raising himself from the dead after he died. Like, so I don't think that's an issue whether you want to believe in soul sleep, you want to believe that we're instantly in heaven and everyone is already there, which is a great possibility if it exists outside of time, your brain will start hurting, okay? Just know that we know to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And so they, he thought that they met, the disciples thought he met actually sleeping. And Jesus is like, no, he's actually physically dead. And then I'm glad. W what in the world? What a jerk. Jesus like, I'm glad? Like, I'm glad he's dead? No, I think you guys hopefully understand uh, we see at the end of the events of this chapter that the grief was comforted so, and life was restored and many more believed and the necessary death of Jesus was set in motion. All of these were reasons to be glad, right? He was glad because people were going to be saved. He was glad because his disciples, something was going to start clicking in their brains. He's been telling them he's going to die and he's going to come back to life. And they're kind of like, mm, yeah, like in the end, in the resurrection, like right at the end of the age, He's, he's putting things in their mind, and then there, there, he's, he's connecting dots, and people who are there, other Jews are going to see this, and people are going to either reject or receive him, and ultimately it's going to start the process of we have to think of a plot to get rid of Jesus. So there was reasons to be glad, not glad in the sense of that people were grieving 
and suffering and pain. Jesus is never glad for those things. We're getting ready to see he's going to um, you know, start crying here when he sees Mary and Martha. But he was glad for the end result that was going to happen. Just like you may be, some of you who are students, glad for the end result, (laughs) right? Once you get that degree and you have your own practice or whatever it is you're going to do, like all this is behind you, all that studying, all those things, you look forward and you will be glad, right? And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. But nonetheless, we all have moments in uh, in life where we're glad that something is finished, something is done, and we're looking towards the end. And we can be glad. And that's what Jesus is talking about. He's not being uh, mean or sarcastic. Verse 16, then Thomas, this is doubting Thomas. You remember the one who wanted to feel the actual wounds in Jesus' hand later in the chapter or later in um, the gospel. And then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Two things. Number one, this is the same doubting Thomas. We could also just as well call him courageous Thomas, Right? I mean, he's just like, we will go. And what does he mean? Like, die, like, on the cross? Like, what's he talking about? No, 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 remember? They already talked about they were trying to stone him. And so the disciples are like, are you sure it's a good idea that we go back? So Thomas has the idea of, like, that's it. Let's go with him. And if we get stoned with him, if we die with him, if the Jews stone us right then and there, we will die with our teacher, with our master, right, with our savior, that type of mentality. So don't think that he was being... Um, I'm a little crazy there, but I think he's being brave. He's being courageous. And I think this might give us a little heart and outside, um, insight of why this whole doubting thing happened as well. It's because he was so gun ho and so passionate about, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. We're going to, yeah, yeah. And then he died. And you can imagine just the steam that was let out because he didn't understand. And so then when Jesus came back, you better prove this. You better prove that this is Jesus, Right. So I could, I could kind of understand and, and, and get around a little more of Thomas of, of why he was doubting. And they call him a twin. They're, we don't really ha- have a reason why necessarily. Some uh, way back um, in church history would tell us that they think that he looked most like Jesus. So he was always referred to as the twin. Um, it's a nice sentiment because uh, it kind of rings true that if he would be the first one to probably die, Right, because they might mistake him for Jesus if they're trying to stone him. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but it is an interesting little tidbit um, uh, that church history tells us that he maybe looked actually like Jesus. Can you imagine that? Like, oh, it's my doppelganger. I look like the Savior. <laughs> well, good thing the doppelganger didn't die on the cross, or we would be shafted. That would be very bad. Because he wouldn't forgive our sins. Okay, if you get it. Jesus is like, yeah, you go ahead. Maybe that was Jesus' plan B in the prayer in the garden. He's like, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, if Thomas can die and we'll just pretend it's me, you know, then we'll be good. That's blasphemous, guys. Don't write that down. <laughs> Verse 17, 17 through 22. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as they heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Martha, sorry, Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So he's already been dead for four days. And I think there's a reason for this. As you read a little bit uh, uh, about kind of Jewish history and superstition, there was the idea that the, the soul hung around the body for three days. Right, like trying to figure out where it was going and maybe uh, to possibly get back in kind of thing, right? Um, and so after the third day, the soul was gone, and so it was, you know, hopeless of, of any kind of healing, hopeless of any kind of anything. And so it kind of makes uh, a, a little more of Jesus, like, listen, this was after the third day. There's no way, you know, that your superstition could be true. And so he, I think, waited for the fourth day on purpose, um, as uh, he did wait there an extra couple of days. So it was obviously for a reason and a purpose. Whether the four days means that or not, he waited specifically that obviously God would be glorified and many would believe as we just saw. And so there was a large crowd, a large crowd. Um, and so as uh, in, I don't know about how it is in different cultures. I can only speak from an American perspective. But I do know from American perspective, a lot of times, um, you know, funerals are very quiet and somber, right? It's very much hold your emotions in, and if the person who lost a loved one is up front crying, sometimes they'll 
to go off to the side or go into some cry room and then come back out or whatever it would be. Um, in other cultures, in Jewish culture, uh, is, was definitely one of them and still is uh, in certain ways, that it was, very, it was the opposite. Right? So the more you wailed and the more you cried, the more honor it gave to the dead person. And they would even hire mourners. So people who weren't even there, but they would just hire to scream and, and just wail because it brought more honor that this person was so honored that so many people miss them. Right? And so it was very physical. So imagine the scene. Jesus is walking up the road and all this, ah, you know, is going on and people crying and, and all of this is happening. And Jesus walks, uh, walks down the road and Mary and Martha um, see him, right? Or, or at least, uh, but Mary was sitting in the house and Martha said to Jesus, so Martha sees him first. And so she, he actually starts talking to her and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha honestly stated her ter- disappointment in Jesus' in Jesus's late arrival. That's literally what I was going to say. Uh, Holy Spirit must have been late, so he was coming in. So thank you. If there's a breeze, we want it coming in. If it's strong enough to open that door, we definitely need to keep it open. But for his late arrival, so I think there's something to be said about that Jesus can handle our genuine heart as we talk to him, right? There should be respect, and there should be a fearful respect of God, but there's also this love and understanding that you cry out, cry out to Jesus. Pray to him. You see it in the psalm all the time. Psalms, you see some bad theology in psalms because it's just some people praying, crying out to God and sometimes accusing him and saying, where were you, and this, 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 and this, and all these things, right? Because God can handle it. God knows your heart. But we also must understand what did Martha say after that. But even now, right? Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So there's this part of where she's saying, Lord, I am angry. I wish you would have been here. You could have done something. But I still believe you. I still trust you. I still know who you are, right? And that's the same prayer that we need to have when we're in those places where we don't understand something and we can be a little disappointed in God. God, why are you speaking? Why is this happening to me? Why did this happen to someone I love? Why this? And, and I'm so, you said you would be there for us, you would protect us, or whatever it is, these promises that you're hanging on to. But God, I still trust you. And I still trust that you have a reason and a purpose and a plan for all of this, Right? So it's that heart. When the heart stays in this bitterness, when this heart stays into this clenched fist at God, that's when you have the problem. So God can handle your clenched fist, but it's a clenched fist to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I I believe, but here's all this that I don't understand, and I am just pouring it out to you. You understand? There's a difference in the heart that is happening there. There's a difference in the midst of that. There's uh, one uh, church father and writer says it this way. Death was no stronger in his presence than disease. But these did not uh, realize this. They would think of death as the unconquerable. With disease, men may grapple and fight and often overcome. But in the presence of death, they are helpless. And so you could just see this picture of like, Jesus, if you would have been here, I know you could have healed him. He was sick. He was dying. But now that he's dead, I mean, he's dead. I still trust you. That God will, you know, can ask him to do anything and he'll do it. And I think there's that reality sometimes we kind of put God a little too low, right? You know, when's the last time you went to a funeral and someone went down to that casket? <laughs> Still tell them to get up. <laughs> Say, get back up. You're alive. Not too often. And I'm not saying that uh, we necessarily should do that, but I think that we need to understand that that's the kind of power that lives inside of us through the Holy Spirit. It's the same power. It's the same power. And we must not just think that, oh, we can pray for him for disease and and healing that because doctors, and we can kind of grapple with that a little bit, which is true. But Jesus' power is so beyond that. Don't let it it limit your mindset. Right? Don't limit it. And a lot of times we pray, Lord, give the doctors wisdom to find what's wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't let that limit your prayer as well. To say, hey, you know, he ought. probably don't have time, but I'm going to share this, uh, share this story. Um, so I have a friend uh, back home, 
and uh, they have a little boy, um, Cade, and uh, he has cancer, cancer in his lungs. And uh, he is four, I think he's four, right around that uh, age. And um, I was really close with him through Bible college, and Wendy and I were both uh, close with him. Um, and uh, kind of just lost touch or whatever, but when I went back this time, I've been following his blog, following all of his posts about, you know, his son and all these things. And he's a, a real man of God. Uh, I, I love him, and he's an awesome guy. And so I just sat down with him, and I just talked to him. And I'll bore you all the details, but one thing that really struck me, he says, Brandon, he says, as a father, he said, I'm leaving sto- no stone unturned. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's just like, you know, anything, any promises that, that's in the scripture, he's like, I'm walking in it. I'm claiming it. He's just like, I'm praying for him. We're doing these things. We're doing the, the, the cancer treatment. He says every so often um, he gets this shot, this, uh, and it comes in the mail, right? This package comes in the mail, and it's a little syringe. And he says that shot alone is $30,000, and I, every night we have to hold him down. And he's like, literally, I'm on top of Cade and I'm holding him down. And my wife is trying to, to stick him. And then some, he moves and then he gets all cut up. And then a little bit of the juice is falling out of the medicine. And you're just like, oh, man, that's like $15,000, you know, going down. Is this going to work? And all these things. He's like, we're doing the treatments. We're doing the chemotherapy. We're not the people that are like, oh, we're trusting the Lord in faith. We're doing everything. I'm leaving no stone unturned. He's like, I even am putting out fleeces. He said, I have a pond out back by my house, and I put a bucket outside my house. And he said, <laughs> he said Lord, he said, I want you to heal my son, and if, 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 if you're answering my prayers, if this is the, uh, if, if there, I forget his exact quote of what he said, but I wanna, uh, uh, I'm going to come out here, I want to see a fish in the bucket. Just a jump out. And I kid you not, about a, a month ago, I was reading his blog and all, this, all these things, and it was the last day of Cade's um, chemo treatment, right? The last day of his uh, chemo treatment, and he was out there doing whatever, and he noticed the bucket was knocked over. And so he goes out, and in the bucket is a fish. Is a fish. Now, I mean, your mind starts going a million miles an hour, maybe because they wrote it on the blog. Someone came and put it in there to encourage him or whatever. Who cares? He didn't necessarily ask for it to like jump out, you know, and maybe that's what happened. Maybe someone, I don't really know. But the point being is that as a father, this man did everything and is still doing everything he can for his son's life. Everything that he knows, holding on to every promise. As crazy as it sounds, and people may think, oh, you're absolutely crazy, to obviously the people that are like, oh, yes, science and, and, and um, uh, you know, doctors and all those things. He's like, both. God has given us both, and I'm going to hold on to every single promise. And he was just like, are there any promises, Brandon, that you know that I should be hanging on to? And, you know, we're just talking, and I was like, man, man, what? Uh, a heart, you know, for the Lord and to trust and to not limit God's power to one thing or the other. You don't have to be the person, we believe in faith and we're not doing the doctor thing. And you don't have to be the person like, well, we're, God has given people wisdom and we're just doing the doctor thing. Hold on to every promise of God and don't ever limit God's power. Ever. Ever. So maybe that be an encouragement um, to you and to me. So even now, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Instead, She said that she would still trust Jesus despite the disappointment. I mean, that was a remarkable demonstration of faith. She's going to trust Jesus despite her disappointment. Anybody ever been disappointed by what you thought God should or shouldn't have done? I mean, if you're honest, I mean, I'm raising my hand of how we should do things, right? And we could be disappointed, but are we still going to trust? And one of my favorite lines in Daniel, we went through the book of Daniel several years ago here at CCF. And if you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And they're thrown into the fiery furnace. And do you remember what they said to Nebuchadnezzar? Some people gloss over this. They say, hey, you know, um, basically you can heat this fire. You can do all of these things. We're not going to bow down to your statue and worship our God. We know that our God is able to save us from this fire. But even if he doesn't, he is still God and still Lord of Lord and worthy to be praised. I'm paraphrasing that. So even if he doesn't, our God can save us from this. I'm not saying he will. But even if he doesn't, Nebuchadnezzar, you know that he's still God, and we're never bowing down to that statue. And obviously, they were saved. Um, it doesn't always work out that way for every martyr, right, in the, in the history of the church, or even in Israel. But for them in particular, they were saved. But I love that. Even if he doesn't, we will still love and serve, and we will not bow down. We will not bow down. These kind of even now prayers, right? Even now, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you. Even now, 
Lord, that I'm going through cancer. Even now that my grandpa has died. Even now I've failed this exam. Even now my husband cheated on me. Even now when these things, the worst imaginable things that we can happen, even now I trust you. Lord, get me through this. Help me to hold on to your promises. One of the shortest prayers, right? Even now, Lord, I trust you. Verses 23 and 27. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at that last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Martha understood that her brother Lazarus would rise again with all the righteous on the last day, but it's not crossing her mind that Jesus is saying, that is true, but I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about right now. It's clear that she derived very little um, consolation from the fact of a distant general resurrection, right? Right? She needed resurrection and life to come to her now, to be present with her now and comfort her now. But she was kind of missing that fact. And sometimes we know the words and the promises of Jesus. Brandon, oh, yes, amen, preach it. Yeah, I got, oh, yes, I read that the other day. I have that same verse tattooed, Brandon, right on my arm. And we know it, and we know it, and we know it, and we know it. But sometimes they have no effect on us because we don't live it now. It's like, Brandon, that was good, but now when I'm out in the world doing this or this person is around, I forget, or this is hard, or I get scared, or whatever it would be. So just because we have the words and we know the promises, that's great, but we have to actually go out and live it as well. And that's the challenge, is to not leave here the same when we go out of these four walls that we continue to be the church, right? And and live it with these words, that his promises aren't afar, but they're near, And we need to hold on to them and and wrestle with them now to open our mouths and to talk with people about the Lord. And just even, you know, uh, even in Thanksgiving, um, got to have some great conversations with some people. And one uh, guy was a Mormon and his wife was a non-believer. And we're just just drilling me with all these questions. Like, you name it, she pretty much drilled me with it. And we were just talking and talking. You know, my friend that was here from high school, um, you know, who's just now starting to come to the Lord and just lots of great talks, Right? But it's, it's not good for me to say, oh, well, I'll pray for them. I'll pray for them. But open my mouth now. Talk to them now. Pray with them now and continue to reach out and be a part of their life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Jesus did not claim to have resurrection and to have life or understand secrets about the resurrection and life like Oprah or something, right? Instead, Jesus dramatically said that he is the resurrection and the life. To know Jesus is to know resurrection and life. To have Jesus is to have resurrection and life. Like when you have Jesus, you have it all. That's why it's narrow. That's why nothing else works. That's why you can't have other gods and other roads to heaven. It is him. He is the only way. If you don't have him, you don't have life, and you don't have the resurrection. You have death. That's it. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall uh, live. Jesus presented himself as a champion over death. While humanity in general fears death, the Christian can only fear dying, right? Because we will never die. The end here is just the beginning, Um, out there, up there, in there, another dimension, heaven, all right? Wherever that is and however that is going to work in our minds. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Only God could say such things. And then what does he do? He challenges them. Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe this? He doesn't get into this intellectual debate and all of those things, and it's good to know things, right, to answer questions. But the point is, is he just says, what are you going to do with it? Do you believe me, Martha? Do you believe what I've just said? Believe it or don't believe it. The choice is yours. Does that mean he wouldn't raise her brother unless she believed? Well, no, because we already know that he's already made his mind up, or that he was saying that he's just sleeping, right? And so it's not dependent upon her belief or her faith for him to do what he was going to do because it was part of his plan at that moment, at that time, um, to uh, bring himself glory, what 
whatever, <clears throat> whatever uh, may be the case with others, she has put her trust in Jesus. She says what? I believe. I believe. Who, what, no matter what else anybody else thinks, I believe. Verses 28 through 32, as we'll probably have to close up here soon, uh, get as far as we can. And then, uh, and when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She says the exact same thing. So it's almost as if it's possible that Mary and Martha talked about those things, right? That's what, that's what it makes you think of because it's the exact same words. That they were probably sitting around after Lazarus died, maybe even praying, Jesus, where are you? Please come, please come. He dies. And then after the fact, talking, if Jesus just would have been here, Martha, it could have saved him. Like, I know if Jesus just would have been here, Jesus just would have been here. And you could sense that disappointment because they said the exact same thing. Verses 33 and 38. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. That's every kid's favorite verse in the Bible because it's the shortest, right? I know a verse, Jesus wept. Done, right? Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could, this, uh, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. A few things as we kind of generally close. I might be able to get a few more verses here, but I want to spend some time here. When Jesus saw her weeping, right? He wept. And a couple things I want to point out here is, number one, God sees your tears. God sees your grief. God sees your pain. All right, never think that it's wrong to cry. Again, kind of the American mentality for whatever reason is like to hold that back and, and not show it. And I'm not necessarily saying it's right or wrong, but I just want you to know that God says it's okay to cry and that he sees it and he knows your pain, he knows your struggles, and he knows your tears. And he's moved by them, right? He remembers them. It's not just something because he, that he can't relate to, like, what is this salty discharge coming from your eye? Oh, yeah, I created that. Those are tears. But why are you doing that? You know, like, no. No. He sees that. He knows he's, because he's been there. He's been moved. He's felt grief. He's felt pain. And that's the other thing. I believe not only was Jesus weeping because he saw Mary and Martha, but I also believe that he was weeping, and we'll see here in a second why. I believe he was weeping for us because sin has come in the world, and it has caused death, and it is now spread to everyone. And he's weeping for that because it wasn't supposed to be like this, this pain and suffering. I'm feeling it now. It wasn't supposed to be like that. And I'm weeping for all those who will go through pain. I'm weeping for all those who would never believe and never trust in me because it didn't have to be this way. But we chose to sin. And so Jesus wept. Jesus wept. It shows that he was truly a man. It shows that there may be no sin or shame and tears. Jesus was acquainted with uh, grief. Jesus was not ashamed of his humanity. Jesus identified with others in their sorrow. Jesus loves people. Wasn't walking around, guys, get up. I'm getting ready to heal him. You are pathetic. It's ridiculous. You know the, the cloudy with the chance of meatballs where that guy sucks his tear back in his eye? Anybody? No? Get back in there, tear, you know, and it goes back in. Jesus wasn't, watch cloudy, you know, with the chance of meatballs. Oh, wait, you can't. Hold on, let me pull up my iPhone and watch it later. Like, no, he, he, he was there grieving with them. He cared about them. He loved them, and he grieved and felt their pain. He was not over them. He was not saying that he was better than them. He suffered all the innocent infirmities of our nature. Everything that we've gone through, he's gone through it and more. And so some of them said, could not this man open the eyes of the blind and, and kept this man from dying? Of course, he could have done all these things. But just because he didn't still doesn't lay fact to the claim that he's, that he's not God. Right? For example, Jesus could choose not to heal someone 
and still be God. I mean, Jesus didn't heal every single person, you know, in Israel or in the world at the time, right? It was select people. Jesus allows some martyrs to, well, if they didn't die, they want to be martyrs. <laughs> he allows some, you know, Christians to die for their faith and be martyred. Then he allows others who are in the same situation, we read about crazy stories of them getting out of it. I mean, insane. So just because he does or doesn't do something, guys, doesn't mean he's not God. Just because he allows something in your life but doesn't allow it in my life doesn't mean that he doesn't love you and that he's not God, right? Just because your life doesn't look like mine and mine doesn't look like yours doesn't mean that he doesn't love you and that he's not God because he is. He has a plan uh, for all of our lives and everything that we are doing. Verses 39 through 40, and Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him, um, and Martha, the sister of him who was dead, Lazarus, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead for days. The, I love the King James. It says he stinketh, right? He stinketh. <laughs> Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And so what do they do? It takes great faith. She roll, tells him to roll back that stone with all of that stinketh coming out and everything else and the scene. Imagine people wailing, Ooh! and then imagine this man who's, who has healed people say, get rid of the stone. What are you, why? Like, what are you doing? All this process is probably, you know, everything that we're thinking now, they were probably thinking then. You could just kind of picture like this movie scene, people wailing, and all of a sudden they open the grave and everyone stops. Is he doing? Maybe he wants to see Lazarus one last time, even though he looks bad because, you know, he, he wasn't here. We don't know. But look what happens. Verse 41 and 42. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Woo. So he prays a very simple prayer. And he prays that out loud. For everyone to hear. And why is he praying it out loud? That you, they will believe that you sent me, the God of the Jews, whom they worship, who I am equal to, who you sent me, the Son of God, to come down, that they will see this as I've been talking, that I and the Father are one, all of these things. So I want everyone to hear who I'm praying to. So there's no question, oh, he's a sorcerer. He has a demon. No, God, praying to you. Father, no demon, no Satan involved. Everyone listen to that? Okay, you write that down. You got that down, Thomas? Okay, cool. You know, like, he's saying these things so all will hear that they may believe what's about ready to happen, right? And look what happens, verse 43 and 44. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Can you imagine being there, this whole scene? Like it would just be, you'd be dumbfounded. You, I don't even know if you could even have an emotion to describe what was happening, right? You just, uh. And I love it. He cries with a loud voice. No crazy prayer, no, you know, magic or anything else. Um, in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19, um, it talks about uh, wizards mutter their incantations and spells, right? They mutter them. They keep them, they keep them low. They want people to know what they're saying, who they're talking to, and, you know, what their spell is or whatever, whatever it is. But Jesus, he cries with a loud voice. I'm telling you exactly what I'm telling, you know, what's going to happen. I'm no charlatan. I'm no demon. I'm no wizard or into sorcery. Listen to my words. I'm praying to God the Father, and then I tell this dead man to come out. And that was it. There was no mumbling in my voice. There was nothing else. And that's the power that Jesus has, the power that Jesus has over life and death, over you and I. And sometimes here we are scared, right? Um, well, there's a guy, Louis Giglio, a pastor in Atlanta, and he did this passion series. If you've ever seen it, it's called How Great Is Our God. It's fairly old, uh, 2003 or four, somewhere around that time, I think. Um, but anyways, uh, it's, it's an amazing, if you could probably look it up on YouTube, but it goes through this, the stars and how big they are. And it just goes through space and all these things. And he, he gets to one of them, and I don't remember if it was Betelgeuse or Betelgeese or the Alpha Centauri, and he talks about just how big it is. And he talks about if the earth was the size of a golf ball, right, we could fit like some tr 1.2 trillion like earths like inside of it. You know what I mean? Like, this is how big it is. Like, if, if Betelgeuse was our sun, right, like our star and our sun in our solar system, the earth 
would be inside of it because it's so big. The or our orbit is still not as big as Betelgeuse, right? And so he just has this line. He says, up until that moment, he's like, I spent time advising God, counseling God, telling how God how he should do things. <laughs> but when I saw how vast and big everything was, it was just like, you hold everything in your hands, and you created and did all this. It's like, and I'm just this little bitty person. Little living tiny space, Aladdin, right? The genie. And that's us. And sometimes we're advising God of how to do things, right? God, I don't like your will, your way. It's kind of like, mm, can you tell a dead man to come out, right? You know, no. Did you create all this? Did you do this? No. You're going to have to trust me. Look at my character through the word of God. Look at my MO. Look at who I am. And trust me, they have a plan, even in the midst of your pain, even in the midst of your suffering. And so he comes out, and Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. And I love this, that, I mean, Jesus could have done anything he wanted. He could have spoken when he was, you know, days away. He could have done it immediately when he was there. I mean, he could have done whatever he wanted. He waits for this moment. And even Lazarus coming out in the grave clothes is part of this whole thing, right? It's like, guys, this is the same guy. This wasn't fake. This is anybody else. These are the same grave clothes. And, I, and then there's also this picture of Jesus didn't take them off because there's still this, this picture of there's something that he wanted the people to be involved in. He wanted Lazarus to be involved in the miracle. He wanted the people to be involved. And so often we think, you know, well, hey, God's not going to do for you uh, what you can do yourself. And I think that's partially true. But I, I think it can be a little kind of not the best theology in the world. But there is a truth to that. As God has called us to walk alongside of him and work in a partnership, right? Not just to do, uh, sit on our, our, our bums and let God do all the work while we do nothing. And somehow um, his work gets done. Verse 45, and we'll close. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things... Um, Jesus did, believed in him. And I'll just 46 through 48. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him go alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And so the plot starts, right, to kill Jesus because of this man. All right, because of this man. And so again, as we kind of close up here, and we'll, we'll close up with a, a last worship song and, and to pray um, for anyone who would desire prayer. But I pray that as you look at this and you go back over and it's, your, and it's in your mind, and we went fairly fast and fairly quickly, and I, I apologize for that, but I know you guys are hot. But I pray that you don't miss it, that you don't miss the power that Jesus has and that God has, and that you can be bold with the promises that he's giving you and giving us through God's word. And we have to be in his word to know those promises. And we trust him in those things, and then we don't limit him in those things. And then we can say, hey, this is the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, that rose Lazarus from the grave, is the same power that's inside of me. And so when you're going through pain and suffering or anything else, just trials, just remember that. Know that God is with you. Knows that he has a reason and a plan and a purpose for it. And it may not always turn out like Lazarus, but I guarantee you it will turn out for God's glory and that his gospel and his name will go out. And that's what matters, isn't it? Make that your prayer. Make that your prayer. God, I want to do whatever furthers your gospel. Sure, you've given me gifts to do this in medical field or to work here, to be mom, be dad, these certain things. You've given me these gifts. But Lord, none of that compares to you being glorified and your gospel going forth. So Lord, that's, what, that's my prayer. Use me to bring your gospel with whatever that is. Whatever that means I have to give up, whatever, whatever it is, I, I'm just all in for you. And I'm not saying he's gonna call you all to be missionaries or he's not gonna be like, oh, Brandon, I'm, I'm gonna go spend all this money on school and then I'm not even gonna use my, de my degree. Is that what you're telling me? No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is as you put God first and you're all in for him, the things that you're even doing now, God is going to start shaping and molding to a direction to bring himself the most glory.